the first measure of variability or spread that we learned about was the range, and I told you it wasn't a terribly useful measure. Well, it's almost never the answer to a question, unless it's a very specific question. Uh, let's talk about something much more interesting and much more useful. Specifically, I'm talking about the interquartile range. It says range, but it's a much cooler thing. Uh, it, it, let's talk about this. Let's remember that we measure variability because there can be spread around the centers, and the center itself doesn't tell us about that. So these two distributions have the same mean, but they have very different amounts of variability or spread. And it's important to know both things. It's also important to measure variability so that in the future when we use some more complex statistics for inferential purposes, variability helps us to make some decisions about population values. So the interquartile range is um, conceptually fairly simple, although the calculation can get tricky sometimes. But the easy version, it's the width of a box in a box plot. So here's a box plot. The bottom of the box in this case looks like it's about 61 and the top looks like it's about 66. So the range is about, or sorry, the, the IQR, the interquartile range, is about 5 inches. That's all it is. So if you have a box plot, it's pretty easy to calculate IQR. Here's a, a couple of, here are a couple of box plots from a previous lecture. Actually, no, they're from a quiz. You've got these two groups, decision times in seconds. And for group L, it looks like the lower end of the box is 6.6 .6 seconds and the upper is 8.2. So the difference between those two things is 1.6 seconds. So that box is 1.6 seconds wide. That's the interquartile range, the range between the two of the quartiles, Q1 and Q3. The next box is much smaller. Its interquartile range is one second. So it's like two-thirds as, as large as the other one. So this is this can help us see that the second box had um, much more variability, or sorry, much less variability than the first box. And the IQR tells us exactly how much less. It says, well, it has 0.6 seconds less variability. So the IQR, as you've noticed, is expressed in the units that are being measured, which is an important thing to note. So like the median, the IQR is a robust statistic. It's not affected, which is not true. It's actually only a little bit affected, and only under certain circumstances is it affected, by skewed distributions. Like this is a horribly skewed distribution from a previous, uh, from a previous slide previous presentation, or by outliers, meaning a few extreme values. So the IQR can deal with both of those. It doesn't change much under those circumstances. So if you have those things going on in your data, if you have a few extreme outliers, out outlying values, or if you have um, highly skewed data, so it doesn't look it doesn't look pointy in the middle with even-sided tails on both sides in a histogram. If you have that problem, then you should use the IQR and not the standard deviation, which we'll learn about in another lecture. So the IQR is a good choice when you have any problems in your data, just like the mean. Same problems uh, with your data lead you to the IQR instead of the mean. So do you remember the median is Q2? It's the 50th percentile. It's the 50-50 dividing point in the data. So we've actually learned what the median is. The IQR is based on Q1 and Q3, which are on either side of the median. So if you remember what the median is and how to calculate it, then it's fairly easy to at least conceptualize what's going on with the IQR. So Q1 and Q3 are the 25th and the 75th percentiles. That's another way to think of them. Uh, they divide the lower 25% and the upper 25% from um, the rest of the data. So here's an equation that helps with the IQR, but much like the median, this doesn't help very much because how are you supposed to calculate Q3 and Q1? Well, Calculating those, there's a process like the median. You figure out where the 25th or the 75th percentile is, and then you um, find where where on the number line that falls. It's more of a process than a formula. So I'm not going to be big on asking you to calculate the IQR. Maybe once or twice here and there. It might come up in a minor way on an exam, but it's not going to be a strong focus of what I do. To remember how to calculate or how to find quartiles, you can review the box plots lecture video, but I'm going to go over some brief stuff here anyway. So here's the example we've seen before. These are scores on a class exam, 60 people scoring on an exam. Uh, the median is right there, in this case 23.1, because that is what, oh sorry, that's the mean. Uh, what am I thinking? 23.1 is the mean. The median is right there, 24.5, because you have, here, let's look at this one. 
look at our box plot here. 24.5 is the point that divides the lower 30 individuals from the upper 30. There are 60 individuals, so there should be 30 boxes here and 30 boxes here. This is a histogram just with lines so you can see each individual observation. Well, the first quartile is down here between 19 and 20. And the upper quartile, the third quartile, is up here between 26 and 27. So this, that's going to give you your interquartile range. 26.5 minus 19.5, which is what, 7? The IQR is 7 in that case. So looking at some numbers here, 19.5, 26.5, and 24.5, those are your quartiles. But we only carry about Q1 and Q3 for the interquartile range. And as I luckily deduced, that is 7.0. And that width right there is sort of my graphic representation of the size of the interquartile range. So here's the box plot of student height again. Um, that's the width. That's the IQR right there. Calculating the IQR, uh, you calculate Q1 and Q3. The brute force logic versions of things is you just find the point that separates the lowest 25 from the rest for Q1 and the lowest 75 or the highest 25 to find Q3. Formula is find the median, then the find the median of each of the halves that's left over. You can do it that way, and I think that's pretty easy. With simple data that's not really confusing, sometimes the, the brute force logic version is easier, but uh, computers can do this too, but people don't agree on exactly how it should be done in certain situations. Software does it best. So just as a quick check here, we've got a couple of slides to walk through. If you're not interested in the quick checks you can check out this video has been running about seven minutes but let's look at this let's uh, this is a box plot of the temperature in celsius um i don't know on, on certain days of the year or something like that i can't remember where i got these data from or made up the data from what's the iqr of this distribution though you can tell that q3 looks like it's 35.5 degrees q1 looks like it's 31.5 so there's the iqr you just subtract. Four degrees. Four degrees is the IQR. So the middle of that box plot, the box part, spans four degrees. So here's some IQRs. I don't know if you remember what this data is from. It's from something fairly um, complex. Some kind of, um, I believe it's a biological study. I could be wrong. But things are helpfully labeled. The five number summary is labeled for each one. So it should be easy to figure things out. So group number one you see that Q3 is 6.4, Q1 is 5.1, so you subtract them, that's 1.3. So pause the video if you feel like and figure out the IQR for the other three groups, but I'll do the same thing. Group two, oops, I guess I hit too many buttons at once. Group two, it looks like it's about 1.1. Group three, it's 3.55, almost 3.6. And group four, it's 1.5, almost two. So what we see in the box plots is definitely reflected in the numbers. This has the greatest variability. So the whiskers mean that there's some data in there going up to the maximum and some data going to the minimum, but a lot of the data is contained in a fairly wide range. Now here, the data is, 50% of the data is contained in the small range. So another, another definition of the interquartile range is the center part where half of the data are contained. Because between Q3 and Q1, Q3 and Q1, you have to have half of the data, right? So this group three, that has the most variability. That was the most varied set of responses, whatever they are. Estimate the IQRs from this. This is the number of daily hospital births in Canada per day of the week uh, from several years ago. But it happens this way. Now that we can induce births, um, doctors and nurses don't want to hang around on Saturday and Sunday, so they induce you on Friday or they wait until Monday and induce you. So uh, figure these out. Monday, I'm estimating by eyeballing things, I could be wrong. Looks like it's about 30 births because it looks like the box on Monday goes from about 420 to 450. Tuesday, looks like it's about 40 births. Wednesday looks like about 30. Thursday looks like about 40. And Friday looks like about 35. So it looks like Tuesday and Thursday are in a toss up for the most variability. But there's not a huge difference in the variability between the days for any of those. Oh, Saturday's in there too. Not quite sure. It's interesting to think about that variability. So here's another one. We've seen this before. This was from an experiment trying to measure the true speed of light using varying methods and multiple attempts for each method. 
So in each experiment you had lots and lots of tries and so the box plot is showing you that the estimated speed of light in each try. Now this is before um, Einstein I believe so this is before there was a theoretical number that we understood should be the speed of light. Group number one it looks like the variability as measured by IQR is 130 kilometers per second. 980 minus 850 was my guess. I'll let you figure out group two. I'll tell you group three though. I thought it was about 40 and the reason I put that in there because this is a much smaller amount of variability. Look at how tight that is. So it's fairly precise. Everything's pretty close. It is a little skewed uh, negative meaning or skewed positive so there's some positive values extreme values kind of wandering off up in the top end. But there's very little variability so if I were the scientist and I didn't know what the true speed of light was I might think this must be it because there's very little variability. But in fact this just indicates precision not accuracy. So all the values were very close to each other but as it turns out they weren't right because the true speed of light is significantly um, lower than that. There, now I'm not distracted anymore. This is the last slide anyway. So these groups, these box plots have some tricks. They use a notch to try and tell you a little extra about what's going on with the variability inside. They, they can flip back on themselves if the notch goes beyond the actual Q1 and Q3. I believe the lines are, the, are Q1 and Q3 even if they flip back on themselves because of the notch there. But you can see that there's a decent amount of variability in most of these, but then there are these two that have very little variability in the intercortile range. Well now you know what the IQR is, you have a pretty quick and dirty but extremely useful and effective um, way of telling what the variability is in any data set and comparing it with another data set.